Since the beginning, Britain has lacked culture. It's people boring and dull, it's buildings all the same, it's food... Uh, is certainly food. Yet people seem to think that Britain has a rich and diverse culture. Well, I think uh, this country has a rich and diverse culture, full of different communities and groups. Um, some better than others. So I'm Molly Horn, and I'm here to take us down the back alleys, along the coastline, and in our woods, to prove these people wrong. As I do, I'll be talking to experts, or whatever they call themselves, getting weird looks from people in the street for talking to a camera, and getting even weirder looks for shouting at the sky! Because this is Culture is Dead! It's the late 1500s, not now, but then in the late 1500s, and Elizabeth I has just started the British Empire, and it's taking over the world rapidly. At its highest point, it will have control of over 25% of the world, yet Britain, the empire's centre, will still be extremely boring. As Britain moves through the ages, it stays boring, even in the Industrial Revolution, when things are changing for the worse. But there are certain small spaces where culture thrives, and no, it's not this skate park. Or this music hall. It's this place. This is the Norwich Castle Museum, and like most other museums, it's filled with other people's stuff. Sorry sir, museum's closed. What do you mean closed? Well it's closed for maintenance. Ash. So let's begin this journey by exploring what the Empire actually is. So what's the Empire? Well, the Galactic Empire is the monarchy, to replace the Republic at the end of the Clone Wars. Though the Empire rose to power, promising to bring order to the galaxy, it oversaw a- Hang on, hang on, is this Star Wars? Yes, yes it is. So who are you? I'm Samuel Aaron, and I'm the curator for the National Museum of the British Empire. Okay, good. So what was the British Empire? Well, the British Empire was composed of dominions, colonies, protectorates, mandates, and other territories ruled or administered by the United Kingdom and its predecessor states. It began with the overseas possessions and trading posts established by England in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. At its height in the 19th and early 20th century, it was the largest empire in history and for over a century was a foremost global power. So now let's go right up its history, like the government with your phone. That's right, they can see everything, and I mean everything. In 1496, Henry VIII saw the success of Spain and Portugal's overseas exploration and wanted to start his own colonies. He commissioned this man, John Cabot, to find a way to get to Asia via the North Atlantic. However, he was unsuccessful as Colombo got there first, and he didn't even start a colony. Unfortunately, no other attempts at establishing British colonies were made until the 16th century and the reign of this woman. In 1578, Elizabeth I allowed Humphrey Gilbert to explore and discover overseas. That same year, he set sail for the Caribbean with plans of cosplaying Captain Jack Sparrow and establishing a colony in North America. However, he gave up on that halfway through. Five years later, half a job Humphrey tried again, but this time he died on his way home. However, his brother, Walter Riley, was given permission from Liz to form this place. The Roanoke Bev. <laughs> This place, this is the Roanoke colony, and it was the first settlement in what we now call America. In 1603, some Scottish bloke, who's now the King of England, signed something with Spain to stop them from being mean. Now at peace with its biggest rival, England can switch from fighting to forming colonies, and in the early 17th century, it formed its first colonies in North America, the Caribbean, and made some company in India, which won't be important now, but will be later.
1695, the Scottish Parliament granted charter to the Company of Scotland, which in 1698 set sail for the Isthmus of Panama. However, this colony was not to last. Besieged by neighbouring Spanish colony of New Granada and affected by malaria, the colony collapsed after only two years. This experiment was a financial and political disaster for Scotland. However, it did lead to the union between England and Scotland and created the Kingdom of Great Britain in 1707. Britain's earliest attempts at colonisation were met with mixed success. An attempt to colonise Guyana in North Africa only lasted two years. After many failed attempts at colonisation in the Caribbean, John Smith formed Jamestown in 1607 and the Crown took over in 1624, creating the colony of Virginia. In 1620, Puritan separatists, known as Pilgrims, formed the Haven of Plymouth, and in 1634, English Roman Catholics created the colony of Maryland. Rhode Island in 1636, Connecticut in 1639, and the annexation of New Netherlands in 1664 saw the renaming of New Amsterdam to New York. The West Indies proved to be some of the most important colonies for Britain. Settlements were successfully established in St. Kitts, Barbados, and Nevis. However, they weren't successful until the Sugar Revolution of the 17th century. Large sugarcane plantations were first established in the 1640s on Barbados, with assistance from Dutch merchants and Sephardic Jews fleeing Portuguese Brazil. At first the plantations were farmed by indentured labour, but rising costs soon led English traders to embrace the use of imported African slaves. The enormous wealth generated by slave-produced sugar made Barbados the most successful colony in the Americas. In 1672, the Royal African Company was granted a monopoly to the supply of slaves to the British colonies in the Caribbean. Finally, in 1838, slavery was fully abolished in the British Empire, and the colonies started to get poorer and poorer until they collapsed. In the late 18th century, the 13 colonies in North America started to revolt and they started the American War of Independence. After years of fighting and help from those pesky croissant munchers, the 13 colonies won at the Battle of Yorktown and were officially America. After America won its independence, it started lots of other revolutions around the world, including the French. After the loss of the 13 colonies in 1783, the British government had to find a new place to send convicts. Ah, perfect. In 1606, the Dutch discovered the east coast of Australia. However, they didn't attempt to colonize it. But in 1770, James Cook explored more of the east coast on a scientific mission. Cook's botanist presented evidence to the government that Botany Bay was a suitable area for a penal, <laughs> penal, penal settlement. The first shipment of convicts arrived in 1788 after a year of sailing. Between 1815 and 1914, Britain was in its imperial century. During this time, the empire growed a lot. It amassed more than 10 million square miles and over 400 million people were added to the empire. Victory over Napoleon left Britain in a dominant position and allowed it to expand further. It also allowed it to control the economies of different countries across the globe, such as China, Argentina and Siam. In Asia, the empire was growing rapidly, being led by the East India Company in joint force with the Royal Navy from its base in India. In 1914, war broke out in Europe. The dominions of the crown and colonies of the British Empire were vital in the success of the Allies. They provided invaluable military and financial support to the dominions, as well as providing over 2.5 million soldiers. The contributions made by Australia and New Zealand in the 1915 Gallipoli campaign helped start their transition from colonies to nations in their own right.
Under the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, the empire grew to its fullest extent. With 1.4 million square miles of new territories and 13 million new subjects being added. In 1945, Britain held a general election and voted for a pro-decolonisation Labour government led by Clement Attlee. The government moved quickly to face the empire's most pressing matter, the issue of Indian independence. India's two major political parties had been campaigning for independence for decades, but disagreed on how it should be implemented. Due to increasing civil unrest and the mutiny of the Royal Indian Navy, the government promised independence no later than June 1948. When the urgency of the situation led to a risk of civil war, the newly appointed and last Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, brought forward the state to August 1947, 16 years before American rock band The Trashmen released hit song Surfin' Bird. I will everybody's heard about the bird. <laughs> The borders drawn to broadly partition India into Hindu and Muslim areas left tens of millions as minorities in the newly independent states of India and Pakistan. Due to this, millions of Muslims crossed from India to Pakistan and Hindus vice versa. And the violence between the two communities cost hundreds of thousands of lives. In 1948, Burma and Sri Lanka also gained their independence, with Sri Lanka deciding to join the Commonwealth, but Burma deciding not to. In 1981, the decolonisation of the empire that had started after World War II was largely complete. However, in 1982, Britain's resolve to defend its remaining colonies was tested as Argentina attempted to invade the Falklands. The 1980s saw Canada, Australia and New Zealand sever its constitutional ties with the empire and in 1984 Brunei, Britain's last remaining protectorate in Asia, also gained its independence. In 1992, Big Maggie T travelled to China to negotiate with the CCP the future of Britain's last remaining overseas territory, Hong Kong. And in 1997, the Prince of Wales, Charles, who's now king, attended the handover ceremony which officially marked the end of an empire. But 20 years on, the echoes of the empire can still be heard today. Ireland gained its independence in 1921, creating the Republic of Ireland and the state of Northern Ireland. However, this also created the IRA, and a lot of paramilitary groups basing themselves off the IRA, which still cause problems in Ireland today. And back home in England, the results of the empire can definitely be seen today. It's in our museums, with most of the exhibits being from Africa, India and Egypt. And it's in our food, with our national dish being chicken tikka masala. Yum. And in our people, with England having a rich and diverse culture. But the real question is, does Britain have any culture of its own? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>